Are you uncertain about where to start a website secret shopping study for your financial brand? If so, you're not alone. In fact, 86% of financial brand leaders have never secret shopped their own website. Website secret shopping can seem unfamiliar or even intimidating, especially if you've never done it before. The fear of the unknown often leads to inaction, but taking action is the only way to overcome that fear and drive growth. That's why today we're breaking down the basics of website secret shopping so you can take that first step with confidence. You're listening to the Banking on Digital Growth Podcast. Welcome back to the Banking on Digital Growth podcast. I'm Andre Kanata, Operations Lead here at the Digital Growth Institute. And today we are breaking down website secret shopping, where to start and how it works. Joining me for today's conversation is founder and CEO of the Digital Growth Institute, James Robert Lay. Hey, Audrey. Hello, James Robert. This is going to be a good conversation today. We're going back to school. Who's that? (laughs) Yes, back to school website secret shopping 101. Website secret in the back to school it reminds me of um what was the Adam Sandler movie? Back to school, back to school. Oh. Yes, oh my gosh, I can't the, was, that, was that Happy Gilmore? No, that's when he went golfing. Oh my goodness. What, what? Wasn't Waterboy? Wasn't Waterboy? Uh, you're going to have to google this. I'm, so I can... I'm google Adam Sandler movies oh what was that it's like got my my shoes hot my, my yeah and he was talking hot. about my hope i don't get in a get fight in a, yeah <laughs> well, we're bringing we're bringing back the because that was that was like a 90s movie right yeah like the late 90s had to have been okay there was water boy the wedding singer no nope. happy gilmore it wasn't that billy Billy, Billy Madison. Madison. <laughs> it was Billy Madison. Yes. Billy night. Wow. Billy Madison, 1995. So interesting. Surely I did not watch that movie when it came out because <laughs> I would have been eight. <laughs> but, <laughs> Billy Madison, 1995. Wow. Wow. And yeah. I and Adam Sandler was in Coneheads in 1993. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm looking at his at, at, at all of the movies. Adam Sandler, yeah. fun fact, Adam Sandler was on the Cosby Show four episodes between 1987 and 1988. That's interesting. Talk about like what, you know, love him, hate him, whatever. Uh, like your your coaching tree we've talked about. Like Adam Sandler is one of those people. He's brought his whole team with him along for the ride. Like the people who um, like actors in, in it, producers, all of that. It's mm-hmm. like they've all traveled up together. Yeah. Wow. It's super fascinating. And I know we just totally went off the rails uh, <laughs> on that one, but it's, it, but it's interesting though. The, once again, this is about perspective and time. Cause if you think about, um, when it's not water boy, I just went blank on the name when Billy uh, Madison, uh, Billy Madison, <laughs> when Billy Madison came out in 1995, do you know what happened in 1995 in relation to the context of banking? No, I was going to go like sports championships, sports. No, I don't. Oh, well, mobile, not, um, online banking. Online banking. Was it Wells Fargo? It was. The very first online banking platform was launched by Wells Fargo on May 18th, 1995. That's someone's birthday in your family, right? It is. And um, that's the only reason that I remember that date. And if you think about it, online banking next year will turn... 30 years old, just like the internet turned 30 years old this year. Now, granted, the internet was around before 1994. However, 1994 was the year, as we've talked about on this podcast, that was the year that the internet reached the mass consciousness of humanity. And so that's the great, that's a great setup for our conversation today, talking about website, secret shopping studies, one on one on one on 
it's not basketball 101 um because the website and the and the purpose of websites particularly through yeah. the lens of of financial services is vastly different than it was in 1994 yet alone 2004 2014 and let's talk about what's changed over that time period yeah, so let's we're gonna dig into today, like we said, website secret shopping 101. Uh, what is it? Why is it essential? How to do, how does it work? How do we narrow down the focus to get the most effective results? Um, because this is something, you know, when we've talked to financial brain leaders and, and you've done, you've asked this question often, 85% of financial brain leaders have never secret shop their own website. Um, and I think Largely, it just stems from either l lack of awareness. I think that's where it starts. We've had a lot of people recently tell us we've we've not seen this before. We have not seen this offered before. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a little bit of uh, lack of understanding of, of what what it is. So I think you know today we just break it all down. Break it all down for our listeners. Um, what is it that we do? Well, let's break it down step by step. But even though we would say the majority, 86% have never secret shopped their site, and that's through a study that we're facilitating right now at a, at a macro industry level. When we first look, looked at this back in uh, 2019 to 2020, that number was 92% of financial brands had never secret shopped their websites just you know four or five years ago. But this is not new to us. I mean, no. we, we have been secret shopping websites for financial brands since 2012. Uh, yep. We didn't understand, however, the value that it was creating. It was just something that we did as part of our banking on digital growth program. It wasn't until we got a little bit smarter. We got a little bit smarter by just being quiet and asking the clients that we have worked with over the years, some six months, some six years, seven years, eight years, what created the greatest value for them? Yep. And that's right. we, we talked to around 20 or 30 uh, over the course of a few months and through those interviews time and time again, website secret shopping studies continued to rise to the top as the number one source of value creation. Yeah. And, and I really, for me, I loved it because so back in 2012, I was coming, no, I was still at DGI coming towards the end of my first tour. I was not participating in the secret shopping studies at that time. I was mm -hmm. doing something else in the business. When I came back in 2020, this was one of the first areas and, and first projects that I really started to take on and, and run and help facilitate and take ownership. I mean, I'll tell you, these studies talk about just a rapid pace of learning. Um, just the, the, the industry, I've been out of the industry for so many years. Like it was a fast pay. I loved it. I think it was, a, it was great for me. I picked up a lot very quickly. Um, and I enjoyed doing these. And so, and that was just one tiny sliver of, of things that we offered um, through the coaching and the education that we were doing. And so for this to become or to see yeah. um, the feedback, it was like, great, let's keep doing this. I'm here for it. Well, it, it, you bring a very unique perspective to this uh, in the sense that, like you mentioned, all the way back in 2012, you were in a different part of the business. The business was completely different back in 2012. In fact, we were building financial brand websites back in 2012. That's what I was doing. You were doing that. And, and today we are no longer building financial brand websites. Our, the, the, the focus of our organization has shifted drastically over the last 10, 12, 14 years to where now we're taking a, a digital anthropological approach to helping financial brands stop losing loans and deposits because of blind spots that they have within their marketing and sales strategies, systems, and processes. And so you did come back and you started learning the methodology for 
secret shopping a website. And to date, we have done 1300 plus studies at this point. Um, and there's a lot of pattern matching along the way. So I, you know, and, and when you did leave back in 2012 and you took a different path, you went to be a teacher. And so I think there's no better person to have this conversation with than you being a teacher, because once an educator, always an educator, um, take us, take us to school here, Audrey, when it comes to <laughs> what website secret shopping studies, one on one on what, why am I saying one on one? I'm like hung, hung up on the basketball today. One Oh one. One oh one. One oh one. Uh yeah. Wow. Back back in the classroom. Back in the classroom. Um, <laughs> well, and I think, you know, one of the one of the things that I've noticed is and what I love about these is the framework is all is all the same. And and very much like in the classroom, your curriculum. You know, you follow the same framework, but every situation, every study is so unique. And so while yes, there's some predictability to it and and we know the right questions to ask and we know how to set up the the study appropriately, the results and the different nuances, for me it just keeps it fresh, it keeps it interesting and it's like it's a consistent source of learning it like we're never done learning mm. uh, so i appreciate getting to be involved in these studies but i think the like the very first misconception that i've noticed or or area that i think it'd be important that we discuss is the scope of the project the scope of the study well be before before we do that i want to roll it back just a, a, a smidgen because let's talk about why and the reason I want to start with why is because once again, this is a very new concept to a lot of financial brand leaders, whether they're on the marketing side, the sales side, the leadership side. And if we think about the fact that 86% of financial brand brands have never facilitated a website secret shopping study, that number, that 86% is almost the exact number of who is secret shopping their physical branch experiences, which is a completely different experience than shopping a website. So why even think about doing this in the first place? Yeah, I think, I mean, that just goes back to there's, there's a lot. I mean, if a majority of people are secret shopping their physical branches, but not their digital branch, why is that? Uh, and I think it goes back to a conversation that we were having the other day. Um, is how is the website being perceived? Mm. That's a great point. Because if the internal perception that this is an informational tool, w w it will create a certain perception. Or yeah. if the website, as what we're encouraging and facilitating the discussions around, particularly at the senior leadership level and even the board level, that your website is your number one sales asset that can support digital sales. It can support sales within the contact center. It can support sales even at the physical branch level. Um, so thinking about the website as a digital retail or a digital sales or an e-commerce experience is a reframe here. And so when we think about what's the number one goal, the number one priority of the website, it is to do just that. It is to sell. It is to increase loans, increase deposits. Um, however, there are unseen blind spots that are unseen gaps that are costing financial brands, loans and deposits. And a lot of those blind spots and gaps can be bridged when facilitating a website secret shopping study. Now, I know there are some misconceptions that, that you often hear through reading these. Let's break each one of these misconceptions down one by one. Yeah, and I I do want and now I'm going to roll yours back just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I I do think, you know, I don't know that a lot while there might be a level of awareness, okay, website secret shopping. That sounds great. Um that's interesting. I don't know if a lot of financial brand leaders understand just how much they're, they could be losing. And that is why I love whenever I hop on calls with you or we hop on calls with different financial brain leaders and you literally run the numbers 
calculator. Uh, and well, I don't know that you actually use a calculator, but you've gotten really good at rounding numbers and show the the bottom line. Like, look, this this is could be what you are losing. Yeah. Um, and when you position it that way, it's like, how do you say no? How do you say no to this fraction, you know, this tiny investment that could be saving you millions? And so it's just a lack of awareness. It, that, that's all it is. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point because our, the goal here with website secret shopping studies is to create a 5X and, and really a 10X. And, and in some cases we've seen a 100X return on finding lost opportunity. Um, and that is where there's a tremendous amount of growth potential. And in some cases, it, I would say most of the cases, it doesn't require a massive change. It doesn't require an entire new website. Yeah. It's, it's nope. making modifications and optimizations, continuous optimizations within different areas of the buying journey. And which I know is one of the the, the misconceptions that you often yep. hear is we have to do everything all at once. And so when you think yes. we're going to secret shop a website, the misconception is well, we're going to shop the entire website all at one time. Yeah. I mean, I think that probably is the number one misconception that this is a huge project. It's going to be a big undertaking. You know, a lot of a lot of the resistance we get, it's like we're not ready for that. Like, we're not ready for that. We just, we either just built a website or we're about to build one. We don't have time for all of this. Oh, they think it's going to be a but, lot of time. Yeah, that's a great They think point. it's going to be a lot, but really website secret shopping studies are designed to be quick wins, low investment, you know, fast turnaround time. And you're getting really narrow and specific targeted action items. And the first place to start is we identify a product line. What product line do you want to focus this study on? Deposit side. Maybe you're running a loan campaign. So we're going to narrow down by the product line first, but it doesn't stop there. At that point, we narrow down the demographics. This is a big one. And we know we know this with a lot of financial brands that we've worked with, you know, want to be all inclusive, target everybody. Uh, many, many times when we send out, I'll work one on one with the with the project or the team lead and we'll discuss the demographics. And I'm not kidding you. More often than not, I'll you know put out an age group, everybody 18 and up. Well, that's actually happening. Level. That's actually happening right now for Every a, income level. a financial brand that we're doing a, a very bespoke study for around their application process. Yes. And I know you went back and forth a little bit um, because they, they wanted want, everyone. Essentially, they wanted to target everybody. Why? Why? Why can we not do that? And, and, and technically, we could. But and what's the danger? I gave her that option, actually. But what's the danger if we try to target everyone versus s specifying when we go out and do recruiting for a particular demographic segment, whether that's age, income, community type, et cetera? Well, you, because you want to get into the mind of your you know, prospective account holder and the mind of a you know, 27 year old making $50,000 uh, living in the suburbs is going to be very different than a, you know, 54 year old uh, making $100,000 uh, living in, you know, a rural area. And so not, it doesn't matter who, you know, there is no right or wrong, but who are you targeting at that particular time? Yes, your financial brand can accept all different members, but think about the specific campaign or the account that you're looking at. What is the target, you know, the, the ideal consumer that you're looking at? And that's who we want to target. That way we're really getting a rich, you know, sampling uh, when we go out and target. Otherwise, it's just going to water down the results. And so that's one of the, that's the conversation I had with the lady that you're referring to is, 
she wanted to target everybody. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we went and we looked at the campaign that they were launching and we said, okay, when you guys went and you, you were planning out this campaign, who was the ideal target? You know, what, what was the target consumer demographics? And that was like a light bulb went off to her at that point. She was like, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. So at that point, we narrowed down um, the focus to a, a smaller age bracket. And then uh, I believe the income level stayed the same, but then we narrowed down like where they lived, location. Um, and so that was very helpful, I think, to hear it in that manner. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, the demographics is the first area that we definitely want to make sure that we're focusing in on. And it could be different for different studies also. You know, your target demographic for your mortgage secret shopping experience might be different than your deposit accounts. Let's roll back to when it comes to getting clarity on the, um, the product line. Because yeah. I do hear when, when, when talking with financial brands who are thinking about doing this, and their marketing and sales leaders, it's like, they, they, where should we start? Which yeah. one should we pick? And I'm one, I'm like, okay, what are your top three that you're focusing on right now? Let's just get real clear with that. And that gets back into organizational goals for growth. To your point, you mentioned a lot of uh, the focus has been on the depository products. However, mm -hmm. there was a, another community financial brand that is considering a secret shopping study. And I'm fairly certain they're going to commit uh, when we talk to them again tomorrow, but they're in a very different situation. They are deposit heavy right now. So their yeah. focus um, when in our initial conversation was going to be on the lending side specific, yep. the mortgage. And even when we talk about mortgage and mortgage products, which I know that there's another community institution that we have secret shop their website in the past um, on the depository side. We're now shifting the focus to do a follow-up study around their mortgage products. However, we said we recommend making these changes ahead of time before yes. we start the study. And they weren't major changes because a first time home buyer or someone who's getting a mortgage for the first time, that's a different shopping experience than someone who is getting a, just call it their, their second mortgage, not a second yep. mortgage, like a second house, but just they've already gone through that process again, or they've already gone yep. through the home buying process a first time, is different from someone who is truly getting a second mortgage, is different than someone who's getting a HELOC. So getting very specific into the buying journey for a particular product line, coupling that with, the demographic data, but what about distinguishing between mobile versus desktop buying experiences, which is another area that we're, we're, we're wanting to gain clarity and focus around when facilitating a website secret shopping study. Yeah. So this was a lesson that we actually learned, um, not just, just in doing these over the years, um, was really separating these into two different studies, mobile and desktop, uh, because they really are two different experiences. Yes, there have been times, like we've seen some um, patterns that have been the same on the mobile and on the desktop, but really they are two very, very different experiences, um, especially on you know the mobile side. Are we looking at your, you know, uh, mobile website? Is it a mobile app? Well, if it's a mobile app, um, we're looking at it as, you know, already a, a member or an account holder. Um, but again, it just goes down to really focusing it into one shopping journey, one buying journey. Mm -hmm. Online, desktop are two different, two different journeys. You've used the word journey. I've used the word journey buying journey and what makes up a buying journey marketing and sales experiences and experiences are well-defined systems and processes that have been strategically thought out applied and optimized and that's the key optimized over time which is where website secret shopping studies come back into play product focus demographic focus yep. device focus yep. well, the last area when it comes to focus so that it doesn't feel so overwhelming and and, and a financial brand can get very specific, practical, and actionable insights that they can apply. 
within the next 30, 60, 90 days. Where in the buying journey yeah. should we focus? Yeah. So we generally focus on um, consideration stage. So, you know, aware, if you think of awareness, brings them to the website. Once they're on their website, they're in the consideration phase. So they're looking, they're still thinking, they're not sure, they're making that decision. And then we lead them to the purchase stage. Uh, the very last question we ask our users, you know, if this wasn't a test, would you move forward? Would you click apply? If not, what steps would you take next? So we're bringing them through that entire stage. Now we can. And we have Secret Shop, the conversion experience, the purchase experience through the entire application. We've even done application and then onboarding studies as well. Um, but we cannot, I mean, I had somebody come just a couple of weeks ago wanting to Secret Shop the entire journey from the campaign uh, to the website, through the application, <laughs> you know, all the way to submitting and then the onboarding. And we can certainly do that, but that is not what these, these website secret shopping studies are intended to do. Well, even then, when we initially work with an organization for someone who's wanting to shop the full experience, our recommendation is break that down into two or three separate studies. So one study would focus say on the awareness and the consideration up to purchase, or just even just the consideration and purchase right up to the point of conversion. It's typically where we tend to start. If they are running some sort of campaign, we may integrate some of that messaging, whether it's an ad or an email as a, as a initiation point to start that frame mind of mind. journey, exactly that frame of mind question that, that we start these studies with. But, but we do pause them at the point of conversion and, and not take someone through the full application because there are enough practical and actionable insights that yes. can be applied just from that portion of the buying yes. journey. And if we don't clean that up, you're not going to get to that conversion piece anyways. Correct. And then the second study would be to focus around the conversion element. And then the third study, and it, and it is possible to do conversion with the onboarding of the adoption phase of the buying journey. But once again, you're starting to become a little bit more overwhelming with the yeah. potential insights and if the insights are overwhelming, then we know that the, the path to action begins to decrease because mm -hmm. you're getting into a paradox of choice. And yep. so when we focus just on the conversion stage and take users through the application, whether that's on the lending side or the depository side, there's plenty of action that can be taken there. And then yeah. the third study to bring it all together is really the adoption uh, and the onboarding phase and looking yeah. that as a very independent piece, because what happens is it's, it's not, we're not just focused on the financial brands experience. We're also doing competitive benchmarking. So we're looking at the other financial brands that they would look at as a, as a competitor. So maybe it's a national brand. Uh, maybe it's another local brand. Maybe it's a FinTech or a, a Neo digital bank. Um, and so by the time this is all said and done, you're looking at anywhere between, uh, on the lower end, hundred, 150 hours on the higher end, two not hours, hundred, 150 minutes, upwards of 200 minutes of recorded experience. Yeah. And so the more stages you add into the buying journey, the more you're actually asking for someone to complete, they're actually increasing their cognitive load. Right. And so the insights that it's almost, it's a law of diminishing returns, basically. It really is. I mean, think of it as going, you know, going really deep versus just going real shallow across the buying journey. We're taking one piece and going real deep in it. That's a great point. And, and, and a lot of that then 
it's like, okay, so we've, we've got the perspective, we have the framework and to your point, this is repeatable. So once we have clarity into the product line, into the demographic data, into the device data, into the specific piece of the buying journey, each into the specific stage of the buying journey, what's the next step that we need to think about in regards to, okay, we get all of this information. Now we need to take action. Now we need to do something with this because it's like insight always has to lead to action. How can this be transferred across different experiences? Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that I, I make sure to tell anybody that I'm talking to who's, you know, thinking about doing a website secret shopping study is yes, these are very specific. And like I said, really deep uh, studies, but the great news is there are going to be insights that you gain that you can transfer across different product lines. Um, we had, this was one of my most memorable secret shopping study experiences. And I know you'll remember this too. It was the uh, credit union who had their CTA that was ah. placed at the bottom of a very, 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 very long page. Yes. And we, after the study, it was realized that none of the users made it to the call to action at the very bottom of the page. In fact, they didn't know where to go next. Um, and that was a major, major insight and a major gap that we uncovered. And so the solution, move the CTA up to the top of the page. Well, when you're looking at a different product line, now we can go over to auto loans, mortgage, credit cards. Where's the CTA on that page? Is it at the bottom again? Great. Not great, but great that we know. Let's move no. those up as well. And so you can take a lot of these insights and apply them across the board, um, which I think, you know, great, great bang for your buck. You know, you're you're creating even more value. And that's just in my, that's thinking smarter. Let's say, how can we take this inv investment and really amplify it, you know, and get the most value that we can out of it? It's creating a multiplying effect. And so- mm -hmm. You know, I think the last thing, if we're talking about the website secret shopping study basics, we, we've talked about the why, we have mm -hmm. talked about the how, so why do this to gain clarity into blind spots, into gaps, unseen gaps. Uh, the how is looking at the product line, demographic data, device type, stage within the buying journey. Let's wrap up and, and talk about the what, like what, what does a financial brand get out of a website? Cause you, you, you touched on this, you touched on action, you touched yep. on insight, but yeah. how long, cause you even, you even yeah. referenced, well, these are designed to be quick. Well, that's sub, it's very subjective. Quick to yeah. you is different than quick to me is different than quick to someone else who is listening to this. How long does a website secret shopping study take? What does it cost? And what do they get? Yeah, so these are uh, designed to be com completely, uh, completely completed, <laughs> uh, completely wrapped up in 30 days. So from the time we kick off, and we have that first initial kickoff call where we gather all of this data, demographic, product line, um, where we want to target in the buying journey. From that time on, 30 days. Uh, from there, your work is done. For now, we take all that information and we we run the study. We gather our users based on the demographics. Uh, we develop our criteria that we are testing against. And, and we share that ahead of time just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, these are the questions that we're going to be asking. This is the journey we're going to be walking them through. Uh, we take all of that. We get all of those, um, all that data, all those minutes of, of film that we sit there and we watch, you know, second by second. Um, and we gather all of the insights and that usually takes a couple of weeks. And then we spend the last week or so put it, pulling it all together, put, play all those you know insights together and formulating the website uh, optimization game plan. 
and we'll break that down into all of the you know key insights, either the top top patterns that we saw, even better. Here are you know five to seven recommendations, um, action items that you can take. And here's the best part: over the next thirty days, um, these recommendations are not. It's not a website overhaul. It's not some major cosmetic change. These are, you know, quick wins that you can take um, over the next 30 days to really see that big uh, return uh, return on investment and return on time. And and the return other on time. and the other element of this is with the website optimization game plan. Yeah, it's the insights. Yeah, here are three to five to seven specific action items that you can take. But then there's also a wireframe that makes it very, very practical. Um, think of this as a um, as a visual example of here's what we learned, and it's and it's not our opinion. It is the opinion of the marketplace. It is the opinion of the prospective account holders that fit into a demographic criteria that. They're sharing perspective into gaps, into blind spots, into growth areas. And here's a visual representation of what it looks like with their thinking applied so mm -hmm. that an organization can actually go off and apply this. And so to your point, it, it, it does take less than 30 days um, and it's less than $5,000 for a website secret shopping study. And wow. to me, it's all about the return. Yeah, there's a return on time because it's, it's quick, but then it's also a return on the experience because experience is going to drive loans and deposits. Positive experience is going to drive more loans and deposits. A negative experience is going to cost loans and deposits. And a lot of this is the blind spots that we don't see that are costing loans and deposits because we've never asked the questions. And so when you think about a return, even on not just time and experience, but then most importantly, return on investment, the question is, is what are you losing today that you're not aware of? And so I think a very practical example is this, say you are getting an average of 12,000, 12, make my math even easier, 10,000 visits <laughs> to a page over the course of a year. And that's not even just, we'll call that just, uh, organic, because if you want to run paid traffic, you can run paid traffic to this too. Um, what percent of visitors to the page will then click on the apply button? Then what percent of those visitors who click on the apply button will complete the application? Then what percent of those that complete the application will actually fund the account? And so within that example, there are three possible blind spots that many are not aware of. Back that up. What are the calls to action or potential steps that someone can take before they're ready to apply, before they're ready to click the apply button? Do those calls to actions exist today or is that another blind spot? And so these are the specific elements and criteria that we're looking for, even in regards to communication patterns, you know, layouts on pages, calculators, resources, tools, and all of those are then specific to each particular buying journey. Yeah. I mean, we, we even get into just, you know, messaging communication, um, you know, what you'd be surprised. I mean, some, there have been, you know, areas of complexity that because of, you know, internal biases, they didn't see coming, you know, we, we deliver some, a finding like, you know, 75% of users found this section to be extremely complex and overwhelming. And, you know, the financial brand, you know, that we're working with might be scratching their head, like, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize that. True story. Um, and so, True. Yeah. Very, very true. true and that's, story. To be honest with you, a lot of this comes down to cognitive overload. Um, it is just a lot of complexity. That's probably the biggest area. It's not so much um, design. Yes, we do. We do get feedback on just about every study on overall brand, um, like, you know, how they feel about the brand. 
Um, you know, can they trust them? We do get some of that just across the board, but for the most part, it's do they understand what you are saying? Well, and I was do they saying, know what to do next? Do they know where to go next? Yes. Do they know where to find things? And and this is what I was gonna say, true story, because the 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 confusion and the complexity leads people to chaos and then therefore they're not going to move forward they're going to bounce they from bolt. the site they bolt so fast and we are talking about deposits or, or a hot topic right now so an organization uh we did a, that secret shopping study for around money market accounts um <laughs> and the lack of understanding of what a money market account is to begin with in the first place was very educational for us it's like if you work within the vertical you you know what a money market account is, but there was one particular individual that was a, in, in, in this cohort of the study that literally when asked the question, and it was before we even took them to the site, in your own words, what is a money market account? And they kind of paused and floundered a little bit and you didn't hear anything. All you heard was typing on the keyboard. And then they started yeah. reading the response of what a money market account is directly verbatim from Google. And it's like, I remember when we delivered that study, it's like every, we all had a laugh about it, but it was like, it was that level of, hmm, maybe they don't know what a money marketed account is. And so we're running all of these ads and traffic and then people, and they, they saw it, it became very clear with the, the, the quantitative data, because what we're looking at is qualitative, the the the, yeah. the thick data why people do what they do but then you can cross reference that with quantitative data in this particular case it was bounces on the page now it was starting to make sense as to where there was confusion where there was complexity where there was chaos where there was conflict and as a result they were losing in this particular case deposits oh i mean it was massive i'll this study i'll never forget and yes we had a great laugh but at the end of the day there were there were paid you know paid ads, driving awareness to this money market pay, you know, uh, overview page and not one user even could take like a stab. Well, I guess they all took a stab at what a money market account was. And the only one that got it right was the person who Googled it, which is fine. Look, I, not a big deal, but we need to know that. Like we can't assume everyone knows what a money market account is. And furthermore, when we did that same study, James Robert, we asked the users, to, where would you go? Okay, you don't know what a money market account is? Cool. Where would you go to find out? Yeah. They searched high and low on that website and could not on their own figure out what a money market account was. Yes. Yeah. And and this is, once again, we've come full circle. We've talked about the why. We've talked about the how. We've talked about the what. As, as we wrap up, let's get into something very practical. Um, you can text text me, 832-549-5792, or text Audrey, 415-579-3002. Text either one of us a question that you might have, or even text this. Text this even better. Text the word benchmark. Just text benchmark to 832-549-5792 or 415-579-3002. Text benchmark. And we will benchmark your marketing and sales performance as it stands today so that you get some clarity. Since it's the very first step before you even think about doing a website secret shopping study. It's like, do you need this? Do you need a website secret shopping study? Because a, a benchmark is going to help provide clarity into what those next best steps are. And all it is, it's a 30-minute phone call to where we, we help you benchmark your performance. So I think that would be a very practical next step that all it takes is just a 30 minute investment of time. And you're going to walk away with some specific actions that you can even take very yeah. from that phone call. I mean, for sure. There's no reason not to very practical. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for another episode of the banking on digital growth podcast.